it's of interest for me to kind of keep up to date with local environment and sort of contextual environment for fire safety if I wanted to kind of keep in, in the field because I, I, I loved it and I didn't feel like I, I was ready to abandon it. When we formed the group in, in 2022, we decided that we need to be at different chapters in the sense that we want to be very accessible to normal people, everyday people, you know, uh, to students, to young people, uh, and sort of start uh, talking about fire safety engineering in a way that would motivate some people to pursue their career. Well, hello, Sandra. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on Fire Code Tech. Hi, Gus. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, I always like to start off with having uh, the guest tell a little bit about their background in fire and life safety and kind of how you found the subject or the field. Sure. So I started really in the field when I started my PhD in 2016. So I actually found an advertising about wildfire and human behavior PhD at the University of Greenwich. And it looked super interesting to me because actually at that time I was finishing my master's and I was really into sort of um, disaster science field. And, and, and I was a sociologist, right? So it seemed like a really fitting opportunity. So I started there. And um, once I, I finished that, this, that sort of side of the story, I actually went on to work at our fire safety engineering group. So I really did continue in fire safety engineering um, area for some time. And um, I am still, uh, even though I'm, I'm currently in um, a different area, I'm, I'm in earthquakes and human behavior, I still find myself uh, reconnecting with old contacts. And actually, I am currently a president of SFP here in Mexico. So we are still having conversations uh, locally about fire safety. So it has never, I've never really left the field, but really the, the reason why I found myself there is because I was interested from a sociological side of uh, things, you know, point of view in uh, disaster risk mitigation in general. And fire was, was a topic that I found fitting um, in that specific moment. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the, your new pursuit with the SFPE Mexico chapter. That's very interesting that you are getting to be um, the president and kind of starting a new chapter. Yeah, would you speak about some of the uh, maybe uh, things you have planned or would like to do with the with the organization? Sure. So um, the we we really started quite. Uh, recently, um, or so it seems, at the beginning of 2022, and the 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 things that we're doing with the chapter, even though it existed uh, before, it was established actually a few years before 2022, but there wasn't enough effort, there there wasn't enough time for anyone to really look into to really look into what could be done with a chapter. Um, and once I moved to Mexico City, I realized that perhaps, you know, it's, it's of interest for me to kind of keep um, up to date with the local environment and sort of contextual environment for fire safety if I wanted to kind of keep in, in the field because I, I, I loved it and I didn't feel like I, I was ready to abandon it. And um, when we formed the group in, in 2022, we decided that we need to be a different chapter. So in the sense that we want to be very accessible uh, to normal people, everyday people, you know, uh, to students, to young people, uh, and sort of start uh, talking about fire safety engineering in a way that would motivate some people to pursue their career and motivate others to better, well, to, to more consciously think about their uh, fire safety in their own surroundings. So essentially, <clears throat> With the team, we decided that we should kind of look into two streams of talks that we can offer to our listeners, uh, because this is a, a essentially SFP chapter is at the moment um, online events that people can join, 
you know, uh, and listen into. So we we do that every month. We have a speaker every month. So we decided that we need two uh, streams of speakers, two types of, of topics that we should talk about. Those that are heading towards professionalization of fire safety engineering local in Mexico and what that means and uh, talk about very technical topics. Um, those that kind of like share the new newest newest knowledge, some research in fire safety engineering. And the second stream is that of um, learning about it, you know, sharing experiences of people who have been through a professional uh, educational formation in fire safety engineering and uh, or know about fire safety, safety education per se. So uh, those that can share and motivate others to um, sort of Think about you know what where their careers are going and perhaps fire safety engineering is suitable for them. Um, and then yes, we do have an sort of um, a third stream that we're developing is that of uh, sort of general education about fire safety, and that is um, essentially feeding from our educational side into those who kind of work on the ground, so to speak, to go to schools and and come up with. Um, certain educational programs for kids at school um, or high school and, and primary school so that they can learn something from um, from what the hazard and, and risk um, are about, right, in terms of fire. That's so great that you're doing, it sounds like, uh, like community outreach and community risk reduction by working with different people in the community and trying to make people aware of hazards. That's awesome. I've not heard of too many initiatives like that, so that's really cool to hear about. Um, so where can people go if they want to, you know, be a part of these presentations or, you know, kind of um, participate in SFPE Mexico? Where can they go to get involved and find out about this? Because I know that I had specific listeners who were interested in this subject and wanted to, you know, be a part or stay tuned with this organization? Yeah, so we are on two platforms at the moment. So the way you could follow our activity is um, follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, so you follow us on LinkedIn and there we put out our latest events and, and, or, and or you can subscribe on our, at our YouTube channel uh, where we keep kind of a library of all the previous talks so that they're always accessible and they're always there. Uh, once you have subscribed to an event once, you know, if you want, we will remember your email and we will always invite you to our next events. Um, you can always send us a message uh, through LinkedIn uh, and uh, I will find an email for you perhaps to share in the credits of the, of the, of the podcast. But uh, you can also email to us if you have any specific questions, if you want to contribute, if you want to propose a talk um, by yourself or someone else, we always welcome them. Most of the talks are in Spanish, but we do have about around 30% of talks in English. Um, because, well, we, we, on, we don't only get you know, people from Mexico to kind of join in. And, and we actually had the latest stats that I heard was 15 countries from Latin America and, and the rest of the world, including Europe. So that includes UK, Sweden, sometimes uh, Spain. So we have do, we do have quite a big audience from all over the place. So the audience that also doesn't necessarily speak only Spanish. So we do have, um, yeah, uh, uh, welcome talks in, in both languages. That's awesome. Yes, I have uh, I talked to multiple um, Spanish speakers as a first language, and they're always, you know, it's hard that the, you know, in the states the resources for fire and life safety professionals who maybe have English as a second language is difficult that to bridge that gap and that learning curve. So I'm happy to uh, talk about SFPE Mexico as a place where people can go and get fire and life safety resources for Spanish speaking professionals. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing about that. I wanted to kind of circle back to your experience as a fire safety researcher and kind of explore what that role looked like. I know you briefly mentioned uh, your time at Arup. 
Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. I've not had the opportunity to speak with anyone who's kind of worked in that role. Would you speak broadly about what that looks like? Sure. Um, so the reason why I guess I was a fire safety researcher more than fire safety engineer, even though I did get involved um, in fire safety, fire engineering projects, is because I am a sociologist or a social scientist by by training, right? So essentially, the idea is that I would try to bring in some social science ideas and behavioral science ideas into everyday fire engineering projects. And not only that, I would, you know, in order to do that, I would need to research how things are done in other disciplines, for example, and how these things are connected. Uh, Essentially, how do you work in an interdisciplinary way where you try to connect uh, engineering with social sciences in the first place? So essentially, my role was to kind of have um, an understanding on both sides of, of how do you combine these things. And, you know, it often translated into very sort of interesting um, outcomes, I would say. One of them, um, and not necessarily by my initiative, right, is, is because there's been great people who kind of recognize that potential and um, suggested, you know, some projects to take off uh, that needed that interdisciplinary approach. And one of them was, for example, a transition program for fire safety um, engineers who are not fire safety engineers by training, but found themselves in a really cool group of fire safety engineers and Arab and wanted to learn more about it. So it was sort of like a educational program that would take them throughout the whole of fire safety engineering, whole range of fire safety engineering topics, right? And would give them idea of what it entails, you know, what the challenges are, what the difficulties, what the, you know, the, the interesting bits of it. So in case you wanted to specialize in the future, and in fact, you needed knowledge and, and expertise when working on the project hands-on, you know, this is where you would get your knowledge from, you know, so sort of internal training way. And I was really lucky to get involved in that, um, in the development of this program, for example. So I think it was only first possible for me because I had that sort of uh, double take, I suppose, on fire safety engineering, you know, from the research uh kind of academic point of view, as well as wanting to learn more about the, the engineering and the technical aspects of it. Um, so broadly, that was what what, was, what, it, what it was entailing. Another really cool project I remember I worked because I, I, I found myself in this sort of um, role it was fire safety in informal settlements with Danielle Antonellis, who actually went on to now establish her own NGO, which in, in, in you know, actually looks at these issues across the globe. Um, so I think, you know, it, it kind of gave me an opportunity to be involved in really sort of diverse and really sort of mixed projects um, as a fire safety researcher. I'm not sure if I answer your question. Is, is there anything you'd like me to delve a bit deeper into? Or... No, that's great. You did. That's an awesome overview and sounds like a really neat program. Uh, cool thing to be a part of. Um, the thing that I wanted to hear more about that, you know, situation or professional experience is, you know, a little bit more about your specialty in social sciences, so, social sciences and how that dovetails into fire and life safety. You know, I understand that you have professional specialty of some sort in egress or human behavior and fire. And I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Well, essentially, I throughout my PhD, I was looking at human uh, behavior in uh, wildfire evacuations. So it's not necessarily um, just egress. And I believe, well, from my experience, yes, egress is, is more about the buildings, but I suppose you have you can apply that to urban environments as well. What I was looking at is the decision-making in... In, in times of wildfire events, you know, so in some communities you would need to, for example, shelter in place. In some communities you need to evacuate. In some communities, you know, you would have a choice to make whether you want to do, you know, one or the other. And it was very interesting to learn how people make these decisions and why they make them, you know. Often it does relate back to safety culture or the way that people are advised to, to behave in such situations, but often it also entails things like 
you know, ability to uh, quickly gather your belongings and, and, and uh, for example, animals that you have, you know, that includes horses and, and you know, and dogs and cats. And, you know, the ability to know or, or, or capacity to know where to go and the capacity to essentially go there if you have, you know, appropriate transport, you know, if you have sufficient funds to get somewhere, um, if you have dependents, you know, waiting on, on you or you have somewhere else to stay with your family that is beyond, you know, the area of, of immediate danger. So there's a lot of interesting things that happen when people make decisions. And I was essentially looking at all of these decisions throughout my PhD. And that was my general uh, sort of professional formation and academic formation. And I am still in this area with earthquakes at the moment. I'm at UNAM, uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico, um, looking at, you know, um, human response to earthquakes and early warnings. So that's very related. But when I went on to work in a professional private, you know, professional environment in terms of private industry, you know, it was a lot more of egress and buildings and understanding the human psychology, perhaps, you know, where, you know, how they evacuate. I didn't do modeling, for example. I knew some of my really, really smart colleagues, you know, were doing these things, trying to understand what would happen in different scenarios by modeling it. I never really touched that area because um, my, my formation was different, but it was always interesting to see whether, you know, the theories and, and sort of like the general understanding that you kind of collect throughout the, your experience actually corroborates or or kind of matches with what you're seeing on the computer screen, you know, when you get the, the modeling results. So that was quite interesting, you know, because um, the modeling in, in, in egress of buildings is at the moment quite, mo you know, quite more advanced than, than the one in urban environments, you know, for very obvious reasons, you know, it's a bit more, it's more controlled, the environment's more controlled, you know, and there's, I guess, less um, individual aspects that can play a role in that decision making, you know, um, normally, you know, they're more uniform in terms of, you know, what belongs we have with us and, and so on. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's very neat. Yes. I imagine there are a lot more variables in a, a wildlife or a urban environment to, you know, the constraints of a building and the only egress paths that are available. So that mm -hmm. makes it sound hard or at least a whole different set of assumptions. I'm sure is how I, I was talking to one of my, friends who is in fire and life safety research and academics and i was referring to something that was hard he said no 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 it's just another a whole different set of assumptions so i'm trying to bring that to my mindset when talking about these things and you know deviating from what i'm used to as somebody who works in uh, consulting in the built environment and fire and life safety so i appreciate you giving that context a long-winded way to say um, i enjoyed that I wanted to ask you about, talked a little bit about what you're doing now, and that's very interesting about the earthquakes and kind of how people respond in that um, disaster or that environment. Um, so uh, is that what you're, the mainstay of what you're involved with now, your postdoctoral research and focusing on earthquakes? Is that what is taking up most of your time now? Yes, exactly. So I'm looking at human behavior in Mexico to in response to earthquakes and uh, earthquake early warnings. So um, the reason is that, you know, since there's quite a few earthquakes that happen throughout the year, some of them are quite small, so not everybody feels them. Some of them that, for example, happened uh, this year in September the 19th, which um, was of magnitude I think 7.6 or 7.2 now I will lie if I try to put the right number, but um, it was quite big. And in Mexico City, um, because of certain soil conditions, we are basically built, you know, the, the, the city is built on a lake and the lake is dried up and the soil is pretty soft and it moves pretty wildly if there's an earthquake. Um, so we do need some sort of 
you know, early earthquake warning to be able to perhaps in hospitals stop some operations in, you know, high sort of working environments and hazardous work environments to be to have some time to to stop those operations and for the general population you know to react in certain way which is basically again evacuation if you're you know on floor uh, one or two or if you're above you normally try to find a safe place or a, a structurally safe place to shelter and those are normally um indicated in in buildings and essentially you know you have that time to react however the research was born from the idea that we are not really sure if everybody really does what they're supposed to do so there's civil protection advice you know there's um general understanding about what you should be doing in in a case of earthquake or, or early warning but in reality there's very little data that actually evidences whether or not people are taking the right protective actions. So the idea was that we would have to take a look and we would have to take a look not only in Mexico City, but in other areas where there's uh, early earthquake warnings or people, sometimes they use um, mobile applications that alert them. And I did use them quite a bit, uh, but there sometimes could be a bit scared if you're not used to, you know, if you're not used to earthquakes or living in an area where there's earthquakes or warnings, you know, they might wake you up at night. And if you didn't put the right, if you didn't put the correct parameters for the alert, you might just get an alert for, you know, a small earthquake, say 4.5, which you probably wouldn't feel. And it would wake you up and stress you out quite a bit. And that happened to me. So I don't, I don't, you know, you have to know how to use them. But normally the public alert uh, sounds at six, magnitude six. So it's, it, it's already quite uh, well felt here in Mexico City and in other areas, depending on where the earthquake is. So yeah, essentially the idea is to take a look, you know, explore deeper, whether people do follow civil protection advice. And if not, uh, why is that? You know, uh, again, a lot of factors that might come in, you know, age and, and perhaps gender and, um, ad, uh, you know, formation factors where you have learned about, you know, protective actions in the first place. You know, was it social media, was civil protection themselves um, and so on. That's fascinating. I think I could easily talk with you for an hour on just that subject <laughs> alone. I love the, I hear the passion in your voice about your research and studying that. And it sounds like a way to really help people. So um, I think that's a very noble pursuit. But um, yeah, maybe we'll have to have you on again in the future and dive in deep on that topic if you would be interested in that sort of thing. But yeah, yeah, I wanted to kind of round out the interview with um, what a piece of advice that you would have for professionals who are looking to um, kind of develop in uh, their careers. Yeah, just um, do you have any um, words of wisdom or thoughts for people who are looking to uh, advance their self? Um, yes, I suppose I could just share perhaps what's on my mind lately. And on my mind, I do have an idea that, you know, the best way to go forward and learn the most is by collaborating with people from a discipline that is absolutely, has absolutely nothing to do with your discipline or, you know, they're interdisciplinary enough or, or the other people have the technical knowledge where you, for example, have the social science knowledge. And I don't say social science knowledge is not technical, but if you know what I mean, it's sort of an engineering, social, sociological, anthropological, you know, and if you kind of mix them together, sometimes you might just get incredible results. And I think you know, more I do immerse myself in these environments, for example, at the moment being in an institute of geophysics, you know, as a so- only social scientist. And before I was in a, um, you know, fire safety engineering group at Arab as the only social scientist um, by formation, I, I did learn a lot. And I feel like there's, if you look for those opportunities, you know, they will really can take you to incredible places. So I think this is this is you know what I could say. It's just being open open minded and not being kind of intimidated, or afraid of of disciplines that perhaps you have very little knowledge of. On like they're very, um, you know, technical 
bits, you know, but, but if you really want to, you can learn and the other people who will, you know, come to the team, they will just bring their part and, you know, together with what you have, uh, yeah, you could just get to really interesting places. I think that's a great piece of advice, you know, um, how I can echo that from my own experiences as somebody who consults on a, a very specific set of building systems. I've found a lot of um, really interesting and rewarding times um, in my career where I've got the chance to coordinate with engineers of other disciplines and it really um, helps you be a more well-rounded professional and gives you a lot more tools and knowledge and that coordination and teamwork piece is invaluable. So I think that's a great piece of advice, Sandra. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on the show, Sandra. Anything else that you would like to talk about or any questions for me before we end this thing? Well, I think I would I would love to hear a bit more about why um, you're, you know, why are you uh, doing a podcast that kind of creates an environment for people to kind of share their their personal sort of journeys, I suppose, in fire engineering? Because I find that in a lot of podcasts, um, people kind of want to stick to exploring a specific topic you know and that kind of like remain on the technical side but i feel like you really allow people to kind of bring themselves on the podcast um and i feel like you know you might must have a motivation for that and i'm really curious to hear more about it sure i think that i listen to podcasts all the times and i am really interested in people's story i think that people's story and their path in life is inspiring and I think that it provides motivation and it lets people know that you know it's okay to struggle with things it's okay to not understand to grow to search for resources to to develop to constantly keep developing and so um, part of it's selfish I love people's stories and um, I think that they are very entertaining um, and then secondly, I think that it adds um, really wonderful context. And unfortunately, I feel like there aren't enough of these kind of conversations, less formal, kind of less boxed in by technical minutia. And I think that broadcasting these kind of coffee table conversations between professionals um is something that you can't read on SFPE's website. You know, I love SFPE. I'm involved in the Oklahoma chapter. And, you know, these big organizations, they do a wonderful job about um, providing the technical minutia and the correct kind of X's and O's of the craft. But there's a lot of in-between space between the code and how to become a professional. So that's a little bit about my interest in people and just kind of why I like focusing on people's stories. But I started the podcast because, you know, I was a young professional kind of searching for answers. And in a department of just four fire protection engineers, I had exhausted my small local community and my small um, inside my business community for people who had knowledge about the things that I was, you know, so interested in learning about. And so this is uh, an outreach of that learning and wanting to broadcast this information that is so fascinating. What you do is so interesting and so rewarding, and I think people should know about it. So it's uh, me trying to broadcast those factors for everybody involved and hopefully share a little knowledge and um, entertain people and maybe they'll learn something too. Thank you. Thanks for sharing and, and thanks for a compliment. No problem. Thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to share the episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. Don't forget that fire protection and life safety is serious business. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are by no means a professional consultation or a codes and standards interpretation. Be sure to contact a licensed professional if you are getting involved with fire protection and or life safety. Thanks again and we'll see you next time. <laughs>